All right. Happy Sabbath, Saints of God. Hopefully we'll get to hear the Coleman family um, soon or later on. It is a privilege to be enveloped by the Sabbath. Um, I remember when I was younger, I, my brothers and I would do everything we could to kind of extend the weekday hours. You know, we would um, play G Jesus Chinese checkers and, uh, you know, figure out a way to uh, do something secular, but just anoint it, you know, because the Sabbath was a burden to us. Um, that's what happens when you're a child. But now that I'm a woman, I have put away childish things, you see. The Sabbath means to me that I do not have to do anything but rest in God. And so when I say happy Sabbath, it is with my whole being. It is a privilege that we have to entertain this mental rest. Um, and God knew that we wouldn't stop. He knew that we would keep going. He knew that we would fail to take this time to reflect. So he said, remember, and he put a pause. You know, if you think about it, there is no other <clears throat> Um, astrological reason for the week to end in seven days. There's an astrological reason for the day. That's the earth rotating on its own axis. There's an astrological reason for um, the month. That's the um, earth rotating around the moon. There's an astrological reason for um, uh, the year, but it, that's the earth rotating around the sun. However, there is no astrological reason for the week to end in seven days accept that God ordained it to be so. He set in place this exclamation mark, this punctuation to stop us in our tracks so that we reflect on him. So I'm incredibly grateful to be here with you guys. Um, I know it's a little, uh, well, for me, it's a little strange. You guys may have been on this call previously, but for me, it's interesting to be worshiping in this forum, but it also shows us that there are no limits to God. Happy Sabbath again. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not, they are new. Every morning great is his faithfulness. This is one of my favorite texts. And um, it comes from Jeremiah. Jeremiah penned it and we know who Jeremiah was. You know, he was one of those prophets that were that always seemed to be discouraged. If you go throughout his writing in the book of Jeremiah or in his second book, which is called Lamentations, you know, you find that he is continuously weeping and crying and reflecting on his afflictions and the persecution that he suffered at the hands of the very people he was sent to exhort and encourage and warn. Jeremiah hated his job. I, I don't know if there's anyone like that under the sound of my voice, but Jeremiah hated his job. And if you hate your job, know that you're not alone. And he was placed in a position where people were beating him and speaking negatively against him, falsely, saying all manner of evil against him falsely, and he hated his job. He got to a point in chapter 20 of his book where he says to God, I'm neither going to speak your name nor speak about you to anyone ever again. And in the same verse, it's like he couldn't even stick to his own, you know, temper tantrum, you know, his own rebellion. In the same verse, he had to say, your words are within me like a fire shut up within my bones. I want to deny speaking about you. I want to stop preaching. I, I like Jonah, don't want to talk to these people that are wicked, but your words are within me like a fire shut up within my bones, and I cannot contain myself. I must speak for you. And it's when he was reflecting on all of these experiences that he said to himself, this I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope, hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every single morning. Great is his faithfulness. Hope. What I love about this concept is that he is not the only author in scripture that leads us back down that road. David, you remember David? Remember him in Psalm 42 when he was talking to himself? I could imagine him like standing in front of a mirror, slapping his cheek, saying, you know, um, why are you cast down? This is what he says in like verse six of that chapter. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted? Hope thou in God. Earlier in the chapter, he was saying, I have been crying so long. That chapter starts off in verse one saying, um, as, the, as the heart or as the deer pants after water, so my soul longs after you. We all know that scripture. But then David goes on to say, 
I'm longing for you because I'm incredibly discouraged. My heart is panting for you because I'm crying for breakfast and lunch and dinner. I'm always crying. I'm consumed by my, by my emotions. We don't know what he was thinking about. What brought him to that? You know, how come he was able to comfort Saul by playing music on a harp, but he couldn't comfort himself? I don't know. But what I do know is that he was not alone. There are many people who are like this. There are many of us listening right now who have been a source of encouragement for other people, but then in our closet, in our private, you know, in our private context, we can't encourage ourselves. We can't find encouragement. David's, David had that moment, just like you, just like us. And he stood there and he said, why are you cast down? Hope thou in God. God is the help of your countenance. And why I want you to think about that countenance. It matters. Our countenance is reflected on our face. <clears throat> and what's going on in our countenance matters. When, when God was being, basically was on trial, when Job was being tested, it was God on trial. It was not Job on trial. <clears throat> and the worlds were watching to see what would Job do? How would Job respond? How would he reflect his relationship with God? And this is what our countenance is about. It says um, that in, in, in Moses, he writes, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. Let the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The countenance that I'm looking for, that people are looking for, because people are watching. When David was writing that in Psalm 42, he said, they were all looking at me to say, who is your God? Where is your God? Everyone now, the world, is looking at all the people that have been handing them tracks and all the people who have proclaimed that they have some kind of relationship with some being. Where is your peace in the midst of this chaos? What does your countenance reflect? Are you filled with hope? Peter said you should have reason for the hope that lies in you. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to answer to every man that asks for a reason, a reason for the hope that lies in you. And Paul answers him by saying, the reason for your hope in Hebrews 6, I know we can't even turn our pages together or you know read the scripture together, but I will read it in your hearing or I'll paraphrase. Peter and Paul had a conflict in life but in the pen, in this one context, they were in complete congruence. Peter says, every one of you should have a reason for your hope. And Paul says, hey, Peter, I know what the reason is. In Hebrews 6, 10 through 19, he talks about the fact that there are two immutable truths. There are two immutable truths. So here's the reason for the hope, guys. Verse 18 of Hebrews 6 says, God promises to bless you and God cannot lie. Say amen, wherever you are. God promises to bless you and God cannot lie. These are the things that we are to anchor our hope on. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock, which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. We have an anchor and our anchor is our hope and our hope is a steadfast and sure anchor for the soul. Happy Sabbath, saints of God, <laughs> and happy Mother's Day. I would also like to thank Sister Bertha and Pastor Thompson for extending the invitation to worship with you guys today. And of course, Zandra already got a shout out, but I'll give her another one because I wouldn't be here without her. And she has been maintaining that relationship and that contact with me since last August. But I'd like to take this moment right now to pay homage to my mother, who's downstairs. She's not um, here with us. but I take every opportunity I can to speak words of ex exhortation about her because I would not be who I am nor where I am were it not for her commitment to her God and to the children that he gave her. Low children are in heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with enemies. So I want to pause and, and just reflect on this text. So what does that text tells us, to tell us? That text is telling us that 
men with quivers have arrows. So basically arrows are in the quivers, right? So this is what the text tells us. These are the facts of the text. Now let's interpret it. Um, there's only one purpose for an arrow. An arrow was not um, a toy. It was not an instrument used to eat. It was not an instrument used in the act of self-grooming or personal hygiene. An arrow had only one purpose. It was to destroy, to kill, to maim, to harm, and it was used in battle. Here, God is saying, a person who has children, they're blessed. A man who has children or who has a quiver full of them is doubly blessed. I believe that at the end of the day, mothers, Unmuted. we are we are archers. God is saying, it is your job as a mother to take this arrow and to sit there and sharpen that arrowhead. That's your job, getting them up in the morning and having worship with them, making sure that they understand the reason for the hope that lies in them, making sure they understand that they're different, they're a chosen generation, they're peculiar, they're not supposed to follow the world, the world is supposed to follow them, making sure that that arrow is sharp, that arrowhead is sharp, is the mother's job. Making sure that there are enough feathers in the fletching that the arrow will not, it will have stability and accuracy when it is released. Making sure that that shaft remains free of nicks. This is the job of the mother. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the mother's job, I believe, in colleague with the father of those children, her husband, is to shape these arrows, sharpen these arrows, aim these arrows, and then in faith, release the arrows into service for their king. So that's your analogy. That's your take home. Walk away with that. You know, whenever you think of Mother's Day, think of this as your job. It's not just the pancakes and, you know, the, uh, the laundry. Your job, you are an archer. Okay, that is, your, that is your new title. And now it's time for prayer. I want you at this time to consider what type of soil your heart is because seed is about to fall. Wherever the word of God is spoken, it will never return void. So you have to reflect, do you have that wayside heart where the seed doesn't get a chance to penetrate? Do you have that stony heart where there'll be sprouts but nothing grows? Is your heart thorny or is it fertile? We don't wanna walk away one more time from a message unchanged. So check your heart with God. We're going to take a moment of prayer. The title of this message is The Pendulum, The Rock, and The Timepiece. Bow your heads and say a word of prayer. Father, you have heard all the prayers that have been uttered, even as they are now being spoken. We ask that you be with us be near to us, that you allow your truth to prevail and that your word will change us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. It's really hard doing this without any feedback. All right. <laughs> Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and clear when thou judgest. David was always real. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to know joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Hear my cry, O Lord, attend unto my prayer. The pendulum. David was on it. He swung back and forth for most of his life. And the closest he could come to describing it was by saying he was shapen in iniquity and in sin was he conceived. Born addicted to a toxic, a toxic substance. And this is the same thought that echoed in Paul's first epistle to the Romans, which reads, 
in verse chapter seven, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. If there's anyone under the sound of my voice that can relate to this struggle, I want you to know two things. Number one, you're not alone, okay? There are multiple persons that are dealing with that. In fact, all of us have, deal have dealt with that. You're not alone, number one. Number two, victory is promised to you by a man who never breaks his promises. I'm smiling, I'm excited about that. So turning your Bibles to Luke 646, we can't see each other, well, I can see a few of you, but turning your Bibles, we're still gonna have a Bible study because at the end of the day, the word comes, the word is its own source. It's, it's its own backup. So Luke 6, 46 through 49, we're gonna read verse 46 last. And then hold your finger there and go to James 1, 22 through 25. So you should have two texts, Luke 6, three verses, 46 through 49, and then James 1, three verses, chapter 22 through, 20, or one, verses 22 through 25. All right, are you ready? So we're starting from Luke. I'm gonna start from verse 47, then go back to verse 46. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Now back to verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Remember that. Now, James 1, 22 through 25. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So think about that. Let's reflect on that. Scripture presents us with two metaphors for one concept. A person who builds on a weak foundation or a person who ignores what they are shown are invariably hearers but not doers of the word. The good I should, I don't do. The evil I shouldn't, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And if you stay with me, we're going to be able to answer that question. Because the great thing about Christianity is that it's, it's about what God can do in graveyards. It's about what God can do with people who think they're dead. So if you find your life swaying back and forth between conviction and conversion, then maybe you need to evaluate. Are you a hearer but not a doer of the word? If you find that you quickly forget the truths revealed to you and find yourself returning to the things you once despised, like a dog returning to its vomit, or find yourself rebuilding the things you once destroyed, consider whether you're a hearer and not a doer of the word. This message is about reflection. It's about honesty. It's about transparency. The fact that no one can see you most of us, the fact that you are in your home, the fact that you have this opportunity to have this private altar with God means that it is more of an opportunity, a more of a privilege to go to God honestly. What is going on? Why am I stuck? Why can't I be released? A pendulum, by definition, can only pivot on a fixed point. Most of us swing back and forth so often that we lose faith in ourselves and our ability to keep our own promises to God. How many of you have been there? You know, that you say, okay, I'm going to make some quarantine goals. I'm going to, I'm going to get some abs, you know, not just one ab, you know, that's right. Not singular, plural abs, right? And then you start that first day doing that five minute workout and you feel awesome. And then you never do it again. You know, you can't, you can't find the app anymore, right? We, we lose faith in our own ability to keep our promises to ourselves, much more to God. We swing back and forth with the least push of gravity. We swing back and forth, having never evaluate what, evaluated what has kept us anchored to that fixed point. 
I'm going to read a case to you. All personal identifiers in this case have been removed for confidentiality. Are you ready? All right. A 14-year-old female was admitted to the hospital for suicidal ideation. When she started to unravel, she revealed that she was molested at the age of seven by a family friend. That was when she first heard the voices that told her to swallow glass. Between the ages of 11 to 14, she was again molested, this time nightly, by her stepfather while he gave her mother sleeping pills. He is now in prison after writing a six-page confession. It was after this that she began cutting herself. The summer prior to her admission, she was raped by two of her peers. She blames herself for this because she feels she led them on. But we know, research has shown us, that children who suffer childhood sexual trauma often become hypersexed or promiscuous, leading them to be ostracized by their peer groups or judged as being a trap. It was after the rape that she tried to kill herself and then ended up in the hospital. When I was a part of the team that dealt with this case, I could not contain my emotions hearing the story of this young woman. And I need you to pay close attention to the dynamics presented here. We're dealing with a real person. We're dealing a real, with a real person who was harmed by men that were deceived by an enemy. We have an enemy. At the end of the day, we have an enemy, a great deceiver, the father of lies, who convinced four adult males that sex with a minor and sex with someone who was not their spouse was OK, just like he convinced Eve that touching the fruit wouldn't kill her, eating the fruit wouldn't kill her. Go get it. Go get that knowledge. He deceived from the beginning, and he is continuing to deceive. He, just, he deceived four adult males into believing that sex with a minor was OK. Then he deceived the victim into believing that her victimization was her own fault. So much so that she should end her life because her life was not worth living. This is our enemy. And I want you to see him as he is because he is taking great pains to disguise himself as harmless to the point where, you know, like May 5th, um, you know, when the culture, I think uh, Day of the Dead, they, you know, was celebrated and Halloween and all of these cultures that, that um, these subcultures within our community that, you know, kind of toy with the idea of demons and darkness and witches. And, you know, it becomes attractive and, and stimulating and sexy as opposed to, you know, um, something that we feel we should not link to or be joined with. There are th so many things that we engage with that don't seem harmful. Sin has been disguised. Sin has been disguised. But when we think of the rape of a seven-year-old girl, that makes us cringe. That makes our skin crawl. When we think of lying on our 1040 form and maybe adding a dependent that might not live with us, that doesn't make us cringe. That makes us smile when we think about the extra $3,000 we may get and what we're going to do with it. When we think about um, a stepfather drugging his girlfriend and going to sleep with her daughter, that makes us want to vomit. It's vehemently evil. But we don't think about that same sense of evil when we disregard the solemnity of the Sabbath or when we engage in entertainment that is neither honest nor pure nor of good report. There is no abject feeling of horror when we do the things that we want to do that are no longer sinful. When good becomes evil and evil becomes good, when sin no longer seems sinful, this is the point that fixes us to the pendulum. This is the pivot point on which the pendulum swings. There are things that we are engaging in, in the dark, in the light, that are destroying us just as surely as the destruction evidenced by a father molesting his daughter, destroying our discernment of right and wrong. We fail to remember that God abhors sin. In fact, he states uh, through Paul, Romans 8, 7, that the carnal mind is enmity against God, actively opposed, hostile towards God. James 4, 17 tells us that to him that knows to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. What are we doing in the dark? What are we doing in the dark that we think can't be seen? What are we doing in the dark when we are to be children of the light, walk as children of the light? Remember Samson? 
If you play with things that make you weak, you'll eventually lose your spiritual eyesight. Remember Esau? If you sell your birthright to indulge your appetite, you'll lose your inheritance. Remember Solomon? If you marry idolaters, eventually you'll soon worship idols. When we lose our spiritual discernment, just like Balaam, we will never see that death blow coming. The loss of spiritual discernment eventually yields the loss of spiritual awareness, which brings us to the timepiece. This reading comes from Ellen G. Wright. Ellen G. White, um, she wrote it in January of 1849. She reads, I was taken off into vision to the most holy place where I saw Jesus still interceding for Israel. Close your eyes. Let's imagine this together. He would not leave the most holy place until every case was decided either for salvation or destruction and that the wrath of God could not come until Jesus had finished his work in the most holy place laid off his priestly attire and clothed himself with the garments of vengeance. Then Jesus will step out from between the father and man and God will keep silence no longer, but pour out his wrath on those who have rejected his truth. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus's work was done in the sanctuary. And then will come the seven last plagues. These plagues enraged the wicked against the righteous. They thought that we had brought the judgments of God upon them and that if they could rid the earth of us, the plagues would then be stayed. This is 1849 guys. And she's writing something that seems like it's right out of 2020. A decree went forth to slay the saints, which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance. This was the time of Jacob's trouble or as Matthew writes in chapter 24, the beginning of sorrows. Then I was shown a company who were howling in agony. On their garments were written in large characters, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. I asked who this company were. The angel said, these are they who have once kept the Sabbath and have given it up. Then my attending angel directed me to the city again, where I saw four angels winging their way to the gate of the city. They were just presenting the golden car to the angel at the gate when I saw another angel flying swiftly from the direction of the most excellent glory and crying with a loud voice to the other angels and waving something up and down in his hand. These four angels had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant, then raised his hands with a voice of deep pity and cried, my blood father, my blood, my blood. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel with a commission from Jesus swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do on the earth and waving something up and down in his hand and crying with a loud voice, hold, hold, hold until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I heard and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers that he gave his angels charge over the things on the earth. And the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds. They were about to let them go. But while their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed. And he raised his hands to the father and pleaded with him that he had spilled his blood for them. In the midst of all this chaos, guys, in the midst of our Netflix binges, this is me now, not Ellen, in the midst of our Amazon cart, in the midst of our Zoom conferences, in the midst of the arguments we're having with family members that we were never supposed to spend this much time with, in the midst of our lives, there is a narrator turning the pages in the book of life and saying, meanwhile, in the heavenly sanctuary. The great disappointment of the Millerite movement in the fall of 1844 was not because they got the date wrong. 
they got the event wrong. The cleansing of the sanctuary had begun and it began exactly on schedule according to the 2300 day prophecy. We find this in Daniel 8 and 9. So 2300 days from that decree that Xerxes gave to rebuild the city of Jerusalem brought us down to 1844. Which means that we are living in the day of atonement, but the sanctuary is no longer on earth. So we are living in the antitypical day of atonement. And what did they do during the day of atonement? What was done? So there were two components, the components, the high priest did something and the people did something. So on every other day, the other in the Gregorian calendar is 365 days, but in the Hebrew calendar, I'm not sure how many days the, the year had, but in every, on every other day, almost, I appreciate you. On every other day, um, the priest, not the high priest, the regular priest would officiate over the sacrifice and they would say the prayer and the veil between the holy and the most holy place would, th that is where the, the incense was burned and the prayers ascended. Once per year, there was a cleaning of the sanctuary. And I'm sure that if there was a whole lot of blood and killing going on, that the sanctuary needed a physical cleaning, but this was a spiritual cleansing that was taking place. And in order for it to occur, the Israelites were told to afflict their souls, to fast. They fasted for a 24 hour period and they atoned their sins. They were repenting. What did I do? What did I do yesterday? What did I do last week, Thursday? I don't remember exactly, but God, Luke, um, Leviticus 4.16 tells us to even request repentance for sins done in ignorance. Even if you don't remember, just, you know, have that umbrella prayer. God, I don't, but forgive me. This was what they were to be doing during the day of atonement. They had their job and the high priest had his job. It was the only time that the high priest um, officiated in that regard and went into the ho most holy place. And they tied bells around his ankle and they had pomegranates and he wore a different outfit. Why? Because they needed to know if his life wasn't right, okay? He wasn't coming back out. He could not go before God. He could not go before the most holy one with sin. If he had not previously confessed his sins in order to stand there and officiate for all the sins of Israel, he would lose his life. So they had bells on his feet so that they could make sure that he was still moving. They also tied a rope around his ankle. So if he happened to have made a mistake and gone in before God with sin, they could just pull him out. You understand what I'm saying? Can you see that? Can you envision that? Can you envision if we were held accountable for all of our sins, if our lives could be broadcasted on a PowerPoint and people could see everything we thought and everything we did? Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> yes, the Day of Atonement, the only time the high priest was allowed to enter the most holy place. Well, the sanctuary was cleansed. This is what Daniel said would happen. The Millerites misunderstood and thought the cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the earth and the end of the world. No, the sanctuary, the process for the cleansing of the sanctuary began in 1844. And now all we're waiting on is for the high priest to exit the most holy place and say, he that is without sin, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is just, let him be just still. But here's the interesting thing. What was the only article of furniture in the most holy place? There's only one thing in there. It was the Ark of the Covenant. Within it was the law, the two tablets on which God wrote his law. Above it, the lid of the Ark was the mercy seat, throne above the law. This was the throne room. This is the most holy place is the throne room, which means court is in session. Court is in session. And at this moment, the reason why it is imperative that we understand exactly where we are, why we're here, and that instead of just hoping that things return to normal and hoping that we can go back to Applebee's, the reason why we need to understand exactly where we are in Earth's history and keep aware of the timepiece 
is because we never know when our case is coming up, when our names will be called, and when, when our probation will end. We don't know when Christ is going to step out of his role. When he steps out of his role as high priest, as lawyer, as advocator, it's over. Then it's just time for judgment. Once the case has been presented, there's nothing else to say. Time for judgment. There will come an end to mercy. The deceiver wants us to believe that mercy will continue perpetually. That is a lie. In the beginning, he said, God is so just, he's not merciful. Now he's saying, God is so merciful, he's not just. They're both lies. There will come an end to mercy. And justice and mercy coexist, are congruent, will occur at the same time in parallel. So now here is something I want you to understand. Also on the Day of Atonement, what happened? There was a scapegoat. So the high priest now would transfer. So before there would just be one goat that you kill or a lamb or a turtle dove, whatever you could afford that you killed for your family's sins. But on the Day of Atonement, the high priest there were two sacrifices, the sacrifice of the lamb to represent the sins of Israel, and then another goat upon which the sacrifices were transferred. And that goat was left alive and released into the wilderness. That scapegoat, it's called Azazel, is the enemy, is Satan. If we do not confess our sins, they cannot be transferred to the scapegoat. We will bear the punishment and not the scapegoat. So isn't it any wonder, isn't it, doesn't it make sense that the scapegoat will try to deceive you into thinking you have no reason to confess? Doesn't it make sense that the scapegoat has a vested interest in ensuring that you don't confess, ensuring that you die in your sin, so he does not have to bear the responsibility and the weight of your sin? And here's the interesting part. Well, all of it is interesting. Many of us believe that because we acknowledge Christ's sacrifice, because we are enlightened, that we are automatically under the blood, cleansed of sin. In fact, so many persons are quoting it right now, left and right in Christendom, you know, Psalm 91, the plague shall not come nigh our dwelling, you know, totally forgetting what happened in Exodus, that the plagues absolutely did come nigh the dwelling of the Israelites, right? It was all around their dwelling. And the criteria of the plagues, if you remember correctly, like plagues four through 10, in each of them, the blessing was applied to the Israelites at, at the Egyptians if they obeyed as well. So if, for example, they were told, take your, take your cattle indoors so that the hail will not kill them, if the Egyptians did that, the Egyptians were afforded the same blessing. Many of us believe we're, we've now moved onto the rock. So we've transitioned from the pendulum to the timepiece, and now we're under the rock. We're almost finished. Many people believe that there is a certain entitlement that comes with Christianity or um, our acceptance of the blood, not realizing that if that sacrifice had been made and the blood pools there, it was dripping down, and the, it, the Israelites had not taken their hyssop, like David said, purging with hyssop, dipped it in the blood and applied it to the door lintel, if they had not done that, that blood from that sacrificed lamb would have meant nothing for them. Spilled blood is irrelevant if you do not apply it. A, that sacrifice is in vain to you if you do not apply it. And guess what? A sacrifice cannot be made unless the sins have been confessed. Follow every sacrifice in ancient Israel. There is no sacrifice made without... One Without first, first, and then, then. Okay. sorry guys, no sacrifice can be made without first confessing the sins. So I want you to see the pattern here. People like to think we're covered by the blood, so we're cool, we're safe, we're untouchable, we are good. Only confessed sins. The blood covers sin only if it's confessed. Unconfessed sin removes the covering. 
The death angel will only pass over your dwelling if the blood has been applied. The blood can only be applied after you've confessed your sins. Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to be mindful of the false sense of security that comes with believing that we're all good. We are upright citizens. Jesus said, be careful, all of you who call me Lord. You call me Lord, but you're not doing what I say. What did I say to you? Confess your sins. In fact, Jesus says, in Luke 20, verse 18, I love this. I love when Jesus talks with authority. He says, whosoever shall fall upon the rock shall be broken, but who on whom the rock falls, they shall be crushed or ground to powder. And he was echoing something that David had previously said in Samuel when David finally figured out how to get off the pendulum. He must be crushed. Jesus is saying here, Jesus said this right after he said um, in the verse above it, verse 17, um, the stone which the builder rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. So I feel like he was throwing a little shade, like, you know, all of you that rejected me, guess what? Somebody's going to have to be broken. Either you're going to fall on me or I'm going to fall on you. Make the choice. Which, which would hurt more? You know, the reality is People believe that there is safety under the shelter of the rock. But if you are not hidden in God, if you are not engrafted in the vine, that rock is not safety. That rock will crush you. That rock will ground you to powder. That rock is not safety. What I want you to understand is we cannot make assumptions about or presumptions about our state of being. Remember, the virgins in the New Testament, five were five wise, five were foolish. The foolish ones were still virgins. The issue was not their virtue. The issue was their preparedness. Don't assume that we will get into that marriage feast just because we're virgins. It's not enough. We have to do more. We must be prepared. We can't close our eyes. We can't assume. We can't, here's the, here's the biggest we can't. We can't want things to return to normal so much that we don't want persecution. What is coming next, Corona? What is coming next? All of this that we see happening, the lovely stimulus checks. I smiled when I got mine. Did you smile? You smiled? I smiled. You know, I want another, I want a couple more. Let's, let's have at it. All of this is a setup for the great drama that is going to be played out. We know that the end is coming. We know what will perceive the, per perceive the end. When I look at Matthew 5 and the, and the, and the blessings that Christ spoke, you, you notice how he anchored it? How did he anchor it? He was like, blessed are the the merciful, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, and blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Blessed are you when people lie about you and hurt you and harm you and, and try to kill you. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. Stop trying to secure your reward on earth. You want your children to be successful more than you want them to be godly. You want that home in the country. We're leaving the cities next week, right? Let's, let's, let's plan it out. We can do a carpool next week. You want that home in the country more than, you, more than you want Christ's second coming. That's why you're not witnessing. You don't really want him to come. What is it that we want? What is it that we want more than we want the end of the world? The end of the world is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen because we were never intended to live in this manner. God is allowing the great experiment to continue for sin to work its own way out so that every eye can make, everyone can make a choice and see that the lie that was told against him in the beginning was false. We choose to serve him because he is worth serving, not because we're afraid. Do you agree? Do you believe that? We choose to obey because he's worth obeying, not because we're afraid. Fear is not what is going to motivate us. 
the conspiracy theories on YouTube. Stop watching them. Delete the videos. Stop watching them. Those conspiracy theories, that's not what's going to save us or prompt us to change. My mother used to say to me when I was struggling, you know, it, uh, with maintaining my spirituality, I, I had come to a point of apostasy where I said, you know, I don't want to serve a God like this. You know, I had had one disappointment in my life. You know, I was that, um, you know, righteous pastor's kid, you know, who grew up not wearing goody two-shoes, wearing goody stilettos, Church of God, you know, patent, patent, patent leather stilettos, you know, and uh, had no experience with disappointment. And so found it incredibly demoralizing when God didn't give me one thing. It was only one thing that I had asked for, one very, 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 very big thing, but, you know, which I'll tell you when we're, when we're closer, when we're better friends, but, you know, this thing that God didn't grant me hurt me so much that I lost faith in him. And I said, I didn't want to serve him. And my mother said to me, listen, I'd rather you stay near the ship so that in the rush you get pushed in than be far away. But now as I reflect on that statement that my mom made, it, it, it served its purpose then, but it can't work now. There can be no accidental saving. There, we must choose God consciously as he chose us consciously when he was in that garden of gethsemane sweating blood because his capillaries the, the 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 vasculature had ruptured this only happens he hematohydrosis in cases of extreme agony like like um in in, in war veterans or women in labor okay where the the sweat glands pool the the, the capillaries rupture and and bleed into the sweat glands and then you're sweating blood this happened and how did paul describe that paul said you have not even begun to resist sin until you start to bleed he was referencing christ we must come to the point like jesus came to the point of resisting the desire to let that cup pass resisting that desire for the greater good which was that if he didn't make that sacrifice none of us would have been passed over by death. So now here we are. We are at the end. Paul ends his narrative of that struggle between the spiritual and the carnal mind in Romans 7 with the first with, with the first verse of chapter 8, where he says, I thank God that there is no condemnation, that I am able to receive freedom and salvation and security through him. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what struggle you're having. I don't know which pendulum you're on. I don't know what sins so easily beset you. I don't know. I know what my struggles were. And I know that even now, uh, good intentions are not enough to keep us righteous. Right doing is not enough. And there is a difference between right doing and righteousness. Right doing is not enough. We must ask God to envelop us so that we can be like David and say at the end of the day, create in me a clean heart, renew within me a rightful spirit, hide me from my transgressions, purge me with hyssop, do whatever you need to do to bring me to where I need to be so that I can be ready for what is coming next. And by next, we mean persecution. I want us to embrace the idea that things may not get back to normal. And even if the world around us in New York may resume its functioning, things have not returned to normal. We have been, we have entered the beginning of the end. And we need to ensure that every day we have an opportunity to unite with God, that we take it, that we don't waste time anymore. You know, if we can't get it now, if we can't get our family altars right now, when we're in sh at sh uh, shelter in place, then how is it gonna happen when we have to go back out in the community? We need to ask God to reconfigure our priorities so that 
we come to a point where there is nothing between our souls and the Savior, nothing at all. Nothing is worth it. There is nothing that is worth giving that up. And Paul says that as well. There is no glory that can be, can be compared to this. Whatever you're suffering, whatever you will suffer, there will be no glory that can be compared to what you will receive when we get to heaven. Let us fix our minds on heaven. Let us turn our eyes to heaven. Let us ask God to allow the world to become dim so that we can meet him. What good, what good is it to have gone through all of this hell down here to meet hell in judgment? Amen. So I am going to sing for you the closing song, which is The King is Coming. So I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes and think about <clears throat> the words of this song. It was supposed to be a congregational hymn, but clearly we're not in a congregation at the moment. So, you know, sing along. It's The King is Coming by the Gaither Vocal Band. <clears throat> The marketplace is empty, no more traffic in the streets. All the builders' tools are silent, no more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labors in the courtroom, no debate. Work on earth is all suspended. As the king comes through the gate, oh, the king is coming, the king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see, oh, the king is coming, the king is coming praise god he's coming for me happy faces line the hallways those whose lives have been redeemed broken homes that he has mended those from prison he has freed Little children and the aged, hand in hand, stand all aglow. Who are crippled, broken, ruined, clad in garments white as snow. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. I have heard the trumpet sounding. And now his face I see, oh, the king is coming, the king is coming, praise God, he's coming for me. I can hear the chariots rumble, I can see the marching throng. The flurry of God's trumpet spells the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding, heaven's grand stand all in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled, singing amazing grace, oh, the King is coming the king is coming i have heard the trumpet sounding and now his face i see oh the king is coming the king is coming praise god He's coming for me. The
the king is coming the king is coming i've just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face i see oh the king is coming the king is coming praise god praise god praise god he's coming for me amen 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 right after the closing prayer pastor thompson will share something with us and then we will hear from the coleman girls so we ask you to stick around after the closing prayer by dr withers church we have been blessed and i want to thank the goodly doctor for a timely sermon we have been going through lockdown and we have been given the opportunity to get close to our families and so mothers i am asking you as i am one to let's make good of the time so let us pray lord we have an anchor that keeps the soul let it be a part of our lives as mothers let us embed into our hearts the words that have been spoken and as we go about our daily business i ask that you will give us strength as mothers that you will hold us in your arms that you will help us to be examples for others around us and so dear father i'm asking that you will keep us from falling that you will present us faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy to the only wise god our savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever amen amen Love for all, 